Hello, my ghosts and ghoulies, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Hiddo's Haunted House. Think about the AAA industry in horror games. What titles come to mind? Of course, there's Resident Evil 6 and our Dead Space, but those games tend to not be very scary, and I'll get to those in due time. Nothing recently seems to scratch that itch of true psychological terror that Silent Hill and the original Resident Evil gave us but a new breath of fresh air has come with the evil within. Also known as Psycho Break in Japan, this game was developed by Japanese company Tango Gameworks and was released by Bethesda. And yes, I do mean the Skyrim Bethesda. One of the most interesting facts about the development of this game is that it was actually directed by the creator of the original Resident Evil, Shinji Mikami, with the goal of breaking away from typical horror game tropes of action, fantasy, zombie stomping power, and bringing the genre back into true psychological terror. So let's see if Shinji Mikami's goal was achieved. You play as Detective Sebastian Castellanos, who seems to be taking after myself. He's called to respond to a gruesome massacre taking place inside a mental hospital and is accompanied by his partners Joseph Oda and Julie Kidman. Upon reaching the asylum, you're met with quite the grotesque murder scene, and after watching some security cameras of his fellow officers getting murdered, we're met with our antagonist Ruvik, who immediately knocks you the fuck out! Sebastian wakes up in the lower parts of the asylum and needs to escape, all while being chased by a madman with a chainsaw. And after finally escaping, our heroes are met with the world changing and twisting until their escape vehicle crashes. From this point on, you need to survive in a wide variety of sceneries including farm towns, churches, haunted mansions, cities, sewers, and of course, asylums to try to find your friends Riku and Kairi. Wait, I, I got distracted there. And figure out what the hell is going on! The majority of the story is told through just playing the fucking game. But there's also a variety of notes, diary entries from both Sebastian and Ruvik, as well as voice recordings from our wonderful antagonist. I don't want to spoil the story too much for you all, so I'll just leave it at that, but I really enjoyed how the story develops. It starts off crazy, making you wonder what the hell is going on in this world, and feeds you incremental information to let you slowly start figuring out until that glorious, oh, I get it moment. The game functions as a third person shooter with stealth elements. You face off against a horde of zombies who seem to have gotten a makeover from Alessa as well as other kinds of horrible abominations and monsters. Sebastian is armed with a wide variety of weapons, including handguns, shotguns, rifles, and the Agony Crossbow, as well as the strength of Hulk, apparently. So one would think, being armed to the teeth, that these monsters would stand no chance against this gumshoe. Well, no. Ammo is extremely scarce. Some enemies will drop ammo, but will only drop maybe one or two shots, and you can only hold so much ammo at a time, as it should be in a survival horror game. On top of that, the zombies, and I use this phrase lightly, can take two to three headshots before finally going down. The enemies are also extremely strong and can deal tons of damage to you, and despite having the ability to shatter boxes and locks with his bare fists, Sebastian's melee attacks are rather ineffective against these abominations. With all of this, as well as how easy it is to miss, the ammo you find is very precious, which is great! It forces the player to actually think about their encounters and how they can conserve ammo, making this game one of the best examples of how to do the survival part of survival horror. There are also a wide variety of traps set up by the enemies that offer a very interesting decision. You can use these traps against the enemies, or you can disarm them so that you can make more bolts for your crossbow, or you can just be like me and set off half the ones that you're trying to disarm. Nailed it. And if combat isn't working out for you, you can always sneak up on the enemies for an insta-kill or just avoid them altogether. However, the stealth in this game doesn't really work sometimes. There were multiple times where I sat back and calculated the right time to sneak past whatever enemies I was dealing with just to have an enemy turn around and force me to fight my way out, or to find out that there was some bastard hiding in the darkness right in front of where I needed to go. Which I guess is just more motivation for you to consider running away from your assailants, but it was a little bit insulting after I took all that time to figure out the perfect plan. You can also upgrade Sebastian with various incremental upgrades to his physical abilities, weapons, and how much ammo he can carry. And if someone can help me understand how Pix in your brain opens up more pocket space, I would really appreciate it. But all of that is really for naught when you're scrounging around for ammo and you find just more brain goo to upgrade with. Oh, sweet, I could upgrade. But you know what would really help me out right now, game? SOME AMMO! While the gameplay is fun, 
the game seems to have a bit of an identity crisis. The game feels very broken up into action segments and intense psychological horror segments. There are a few times where the game will throw you into horror mode where there's not a whole lot of enemies and are filled with atmosphere and scares, but then a few minutes later it'll throw you into another zombie horde to fight your way through. The two types of gameplay just feel so different, almost as if there was a team dedicated to each segment. And in all honesty, this might be something that could be overlooked, but no. There is seriously a part of the game where you get on a turret and mow down waves of zombies, like what? You build up all of this psychological horror and then you give us this? Sure, the scene is very satisfying, but you can't have this with this. They don't mix. Well, good job, team. Seems like we got the Microsoft fanboys interested again. Now let's throw in more horror. Oh no, we're losing them. And more zombies! <laughs> the game's atmosphere is beautiful. Immediately, I'm sure you notice that the game is in widescreen, giving it a very interesting and cinematic experience. The lighting is also superb, making each room ooze with atmosphere as you can see the dust particles and making the enemies just look ooh, so delightfully creepy. A lot of the atmosphere is thanks to the composer, Masafumi Takeda. The tracks are very subtle and chilling in the calmer parts of the game and really sets the feeling of loneliness and tense moments of trying to survive, and then kicking up and becoming very heavy and nerve-wracking in the more intense parts of the game. These set the mood perfectly for the player and just allows so much immersion. What I feel is a huge asset to the overall atmosphere of the game is the ever-changing surroundings. The game will jump and pull you away from your locations just to throw you back in a new area to try to get your bearings in this chaotic world. While this is something that can be nitpicked and seems to really clash with the overall flow for the player, it makes the player feel an overbearing feeling of oppression that you can be thrown into a world and a new nightmare at a whim, removing any sense of power from the player. <laughs> this game isn't the scariest game in all existence, but when the game kicks it into horror mode, god does it do it right. With how oppressive and immersive the atmosphere is, this game just allows the player to really feel that overwhelming sense of dread around each corner. What really accents this feeling is the survival aspect of the game. Even against some of the weaker enemies with low health and practically no ammo, you feel the stress of encountering just a lone enemy. Even when fighting that enemy, if you exhaust your resources, almost certain death is ensured, making you immediately panic to try to find something of use or a place to hide. The game shies away from too many jump scares and uses the majority of its scares in just the subtlety of the monsters and your instincts to survive, making the unscripted jump scares a pure delight. Most of them took place during fights or even after fights when you would turn around and suddenly an enemy is directly behind you or an enemy grabs you while you're trying to fend off a horde in front of you. The perfect example of this is the invisible enemies. For instance, see this guy right here? He's only visible through the lighting and dust effects in the room and a few moments later, he's gone. These guys are great because they set up a feeling of paranoia wondering if someone is around before they try to give Sebastian a kiss with their cuttlefish face. Where I think this game shines is it does an amazing job of never letting the player feel safe. Even with all of your weapons, all of the enemies are extremely strong and the lack of ammo really removes the feeling of power from the player. The game even torments you in the safe areas of the game. You know, the areas that are supposed to be a safe haven for upgrading and saving, but no. There are times where this area will be dark and menacing, making nowhere safe from this evil with them. Okay, so as much as I like to keep these videos spoiler free, I do need to spoil the story a little bit just to talk about some of the enemies. So here's your spoiler warning. Click to this part of the video to skip it. Spoilers coming in 3, 2, 1. Okay, here we go. So the big twist in this game is the fact that you and your colleagues are actually inside Ruvik's mind. Kinda gives a whole new meaning to welcome to my twisted mind, huh? So all of the scenery are actually parts of Ruvik's memories, as well as the monsters being representations of Ruvik's memories and thoughts, giving each monster a deep and psychological meaning very reminiscent of Silent Hill. The two monsters in specific I want to address are Laura and the Keeper. Laura is actually Ruvik's sister, N not, not this one, th that one, who Ruvik shared a very deep bond with until she tragically and rather violently died in a fire. Thus, the monster version of Laura was born out of his memories of her death and his vengefulness for the people who killed her. Laura is a six-limbed creature with long black hair, and I love her so much. She'll appear bursting out of a corpse and will hunt you down. She's practically invulnerable to bullets, and the only way to hurt her is with fire, 
which is an amazing narrative and design choice. What makes her the most terrifying is just simply how she moves and warps around, ducking down into the ground just to rip her way out of another corpse, as well as just how vicious and deadly she is. No matter what, she is an instant kill and you get to watch as she violently bashes poor Seb's face in. Next is the enemy called The Keeper, who I like to call Boxhead. Cause I mean, come on, tall man, wearing an apron, who has a large geometrical shape on his head? Anyway, The Keeper actually has a safe on his head and is the manifestation of Ruvik's own safe where he kept all of his research, as well as representing the injustice he felt when his research got stolen from him, and his urges to destroy anyone who got near. The Keeper wields a large hammer and a sack filled with potatoes, er, the heads of his victims, as well as the ability to set barbed wire landmine traps. If Sebastian is caught in one of these traps while the Keeper is around, he'll bop poor Seb on the head for an instant kill, then drag the detective back for some snoo stew. This is such a cool design, because not only does it represent the same traps that Ruvik used to kill anyone who got near his research, but it makes the fight that much more dynamic. Not only are you trying to avoid this beast, but you're also trying to avoid the traps he places. My favorite thing about this bastard is his invulnerability. While he can be defeated with bullets, that won't stop him. Simply killing his physical body has no meaning since he can just manifest himself wherever another safe is. And he knows this. He literally kills himself in gruesome detail I might add, just to appear in the same room as Sebastian. This adds so much oppression to his fights. No matter how many times you kill him, he will come back, and he will kill you. And finally we come to Ruvik, the bad man behind it all. Ruvik makes various appearances throughout the game and just adds so much oppression to everything the player does. Being in his mind, he has all dominion over those poor souls trapped within him. Just when you finally get your partners, Ruvik rips that feeling of security away by separating you guys once again, making the player feel that sense of hopelessness and loneliness, taking away even the hope of companionship in this madman's mind. The feeling of helplessness is even more amplified when Ruvik actually does take action against Sebastian. You can't kill Ruvik, and if he gets too close, he'll flick our gumshoe's forehead, killing him instantly. This is his world. You are his prisoner, and you will suffer. And finally, the icing on this horror cake is a wide variety of death animations. Every death in this game has a different animation and each one pleases the inner gore hound in me. They're violent, they're gruesome, and the wide variety just makes me want to see them all. They're all very reminiscent of Resident Evil 4, however that probably has a lot to do with our lovely director Shinji Mikami. This is all great. However, the game fails to keep that player completely immersed in the pure psychological dread. We've already talked about it, but the game's identity crisis between action, survival, stomp all zombies mode, and its intense horror segments break up the game so much that for me as a player, it really separated and disrupted my fear. One could argue that the action segments pull on your sense of survival and the fear of those situations are more based on the moments where you run out of ammo and start panicking. However, you can't have intense moments of action mixed with psychological horror. You can only have one or the other. When you can fight your assailants armed to the teeth, you give the player power. You give the player the ability to defeat anything in their way, so whatever you fight doesn't scare you. It's not threatening because those things are gone with the pull of the trigger. But when the game goes into horror mode, it does an amazing job of removing that sense of power. However, it just loves to give you back that ability with each action segment that never really allows the player to build up the tension for the next scare. There's a part of me that wants to say that this game was a huge disappointment. It was hyped as being a throwback to the psychological horror masters of yesteryear, but with all the action segments and the flood of generic zombie monsters, it really didn't make it any better than the AAA titles nowadays that just claim to be scary. But I just had so much fun with this game and it actually exceeded all of my expectations. When the game kicked it into horror mode, it left me with some great scares and I enjoyed every minute of it. While it's not the horror masterpiece it wanted to be so bad, it was such a breath of fresh air and I hope that future developers will take note and bring the genre back to what it's supposed to be. Creepy, atmospheric, and leave you chilled to the bone even after putting the game down. Thank you guys for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. If you guys did enjoy it, don't forget to click that like button. 
And if you want to keep up with other haunted house videos and all the other content that we have on this channel, don't forget to click subscribe. If you want to watch another haunted house episode, click this annotation here. And if you want to watch Mrs. Cupcake and myself go through the evil within, click this annotation right there. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter with the links in the description below. Thank you all again, and I will see you guys next time.